Hello everybody, James here, Franchise University, with Shane Douglas yes, himself, and as uh, I just said to Shane beforehand, that my missus is downstairs and she's hungry, so I'm going to get straight into the point just before we do, we've got an email here, ShaneDouglasQuestions at gmail.com to submit your question to the franchise himself for a future consideration to have your pose opposed to the uh, Dean of Franchise University. And also, this is Clash of the Champions 22 Part 2. We're going to be continuing our review of that show. So, let's launch straight into it. And we left off with Brad Armstrong and Chris Benoit. And we're going to go straight into Tony Schiavone introducing us to a video package featuring the reunited Rock and Roll Express and introducing... Did you watch this? It was just the oddest yeah. thing to dump in the middle of a show. Uh, yeah. Introducing Smoky Mountain Wrestling in a working agreement to have rock and roll to come to WCW for the Super Bowl three pay per view. Then an extended look at the rock and roll. <laughs> extended was, if that's the word, uh, yeah. look at Rock and Roll Express and the Heavenly Bodies. So, huh, what a weird thing to put on. It looked like VHS footage, basically, that had been sent in from Smoky Mountain. Yeah. Yeah, sort of like uh, like the uh, fan cam in e- later in ECW. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there were a couple of things that stuck out to me. First of all, have always been a huge fan of of uh, Tom Pritchard's work, Doctor Tom Pritchard, right? Is and and the the long haired Tom. That's the Tom that that's in my my <laughs> memory banks. You know, just oh yeah, just really really good in the ring. And again, watch his timing that. But I gotta ask, what the hell did Stan Lane have on his head? It looked like a jog strap. Ah, there's a story behind that. Would you okay. like to know? Yes, yeah, I'm dying. He had sort of like almost like a box. No, it's like an amateur wrestling headgear because apparently the story goes he had recently been fitted with some sort of wig. He thought he was losing his hair, so he ended up having a wig <laughs> installed. And I think the way that <laughs> Cornette says it, that it was sewn into his scalp. What the hell? Yeah, that's crazy, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I saw it on that. I don't remember Stan having like. I, you know, of course, after a few minutes, I realized it's like an amateur headgear. And I'm like, what? It just looks so out of place. But like one of the things I want to point out in this match is, uh, like, first of all, yeah, it was, you see like how rock and roll could command an audience, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the little ways that they would, the little tricky ways they would go into and out of spots. But watch Stan and uh, uh, Tom's, uh, the Heavenly Bodies. Watch Stan Lane and Tom Pritchard's uh, uh, positioning they're everywhere they need to be and, and you know that that's you know when you hear the phrase ring generalship that's really what it's referring to uh the, both of them are so pro that they're pitching themselves to the rock and roll to make the rock and roll look good and the rock and roll is doing a great job enough on their own to make themselves look good they know what to do but when you put that kind of just perfect ingredients into the ring you can see how how just effortless they make it look and you know and it really does look like they're just having fun they're just in the ring doing this and doing that and boy it's just it, it, everything is ending up exactly where it needs to be and then they make it look easy that ain't easy to do uh you know if you have one person out of the four not going in you know going along it, it can make it really difficult uh but to me like that like you said the the, the footage was a bit rawer than say excuse me then say like what we were already watching on the clash but to, because of the uh ecw fan cam that never really turned me off I, it was sort of like hey we're getting a cool look at something else and i'm guessing at this point uh smoky mountain must have been trying to forge a relationship with wcw that'd be mm-hmm. the only reason they would show that and uh uh but you know it's i i do have a question because i asked moose right at the end of it who was the person that walked out right at the very end before the clip cuts off in green tights? Uh, do I have to find it and have a look? Because I didn't know. Uh, yeah, I thought you might know the top of your head. It was, it, it, there was a, it, they come out to the ring and they turn sideways. And at the last second, they turn. You can see a bit of their face before it cuts off and goes back to uh, the clash. There's a in that split second, it looked a little bit like Jack Victory to me, but it wasn't it was like so it wasn't quick. Brian Lee. Like, it wasn't Brian Lee with the long blonde hair? Was it? No, had short hair, hmm. short, short, like blondish reddish hair. Okay, this is gonna uh, bug me. I'm just gonna find out one sec. 
All right, Shane and I have both watched it, and neither of us can figure out who it is. So that's sort of like a dead dead duck in the water kind of uh, topic to go through. Uh, Rock and roll coming back in 1993, as you say, rightly so, Smoky Mountain and Bill Watts enter a very brief working relationship, which ends pretty much when Bill Watts disappears and then Eric takes over. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember the... In fact, I'm going to skip out that question and say, was there any chance of you ever going to Smoky Mountain wrestling? Uh, Jim Cornette had called me and the recollection on this is so vivid. I remember I was taking a bath and uh, he had called me and we talked at length. He offered me a spot to come in and it was right after Eddie Gilbert had called. And if you recall, I'd mentioned that Eddie would do these repeat like five or six calls kept, you know, sweetening that he and Todd would call and up the money a little bit and, you know, this and that. And then, he finally offered as the uh, lead heel position, which I wanted to, again, like I said earlier, wanted to learn all the aspects of my, you know, business, my craft before I'd gotten out. And so it was like, as much as I liked Jim and, uh, you know, really would have liked to gone there uh, and, and work with the people that they had there. I'd already sort of settled in my mind. If I'm going anywhere uh, it, it, at that moment in time, my mind was, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I'm I'm out of the business, and I'm gonna stick over here and do this. And uh, but if I were to go somewhere, it would probably be with Eddie because he'd give me my original break in the business. That was nothing against Jim, nothing against Smoky Mountain. Uh, I just was more affinity and respect for uh, for Eddie Gilbert, which <laughs> we would later find out wouldn't be there for for long anyway. Um, but yeah, there there wasn't offer made. As I recall, though, there was no discussion of what the spot would be, what the character would be. Um, uh, it was just that one call, uh, and you know, nothing ever, obviously nothing came of it. Uh, but yeah, he had contacted me about going in there and it was right on the heels of after Eddie and Todd had called and, uh, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, going to ECW obviously, but it was, uh, uh, I, we were, you know, where I was in Pittsburgh, we weren't getting a lot of information about Smoky Mountain. I mean, it was, you were aware there was another promotion out there, uh, you know, but, you know, like weren't sure of, you know, is it a bigger promotion, a smaller promotion? Uh, it just, uh, it seemed to me at the time to be an extension of Ron Fuller's uh, Continental, Northern Continental. And, uh, you know, it, it's, again, it was nothing good bad or ugly uh about smoky mountain jim or or uh ron fuller it was i had made this in my mind idea that if, if i'm going to go anywhere back it would be ecw eastern championship wrestling because of eddie and todd but my mindset at the time was i'm not going back to the business i was like the alcoholic per, staying proverbially out of the proverbially out of the bar i didn't want to be around it and then get sucked back into it and so I, I think that's part of the reason why I kept taking you know, the repeated phone calls from Todd and Paul was uh, I was trying to – Todd and Paul, Todd and Eddie. Um, I know it didn't sound right. I was trying to find the right place to say, appreciate it, just not interested. And instead, they they fooled me by, you know, keep sweetening the pot, and then, you know, Eddie had come up with this, you know, lead heel position. And that was just enough to get me to take the – the automatic now I'm getting, I'm staying out of the business uh, and hmm, int- you know, question mark over my head. Interesting. What could this be? And uh, honestly, we thought, uh, I think part of the, the equation for me was uh, like, like Terry had asked me on that first trip in, we both got picked up at the same time. And he asked that, uh, well, Shane, how long do you think we'll drive, you know, ride this train before it runs off the tracks. And we joked about it in the vehicle going back to the hotel. We figured two, three months, they'd be out of business anyway, right? ECW. So, uh, you know, I, I think it was just a, looking for a way to keep them on the line long enough to like give, give them a no and have them accept the no and not call back again. Uh, but in that meantime, you know, just, you know, Eddie <laughs> figured out the, the, the one thing that could get the alcoholic to go back into the bar. <laughs> um, so yeah, but there wasn't, there was a connection made with Jim and uh, uh, nothing ever came. There was no formal offer of, okay, mid-card spot, a top spot, this character, that character. It was just, hey, we're doing this new thing. 
would be something you're interested in, blah, 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 that kind of thing. It's, you know, very, very esoteric. Now, let's move on to the first match release of this episode that we're going to be referring to, and I think you'll agree with me the highlight of the show. The arm wrestling contest between Vinny Vegas versus Tony Atlas. <laughs> Heavy Metal Van Hammer had won the arm wrestling. There was a tournament of this thing. A tournament yeah. of arm wrestling matches. Oh, God. But thankfully, uh, he's injured, so Tony Atlas, who wasn't entered into the tournament, goes against Kevin Nash, who is, of course, Vinny Vegas, who's left-handed. Ventura asks Atlas if he's happy to go left-handed, and then he sort of just cuts Tony off when he starts rambling. So he's like, I can do this way, I can do this way. And then I just go, that's great. <laughs> that's just yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, arm wrestling portion lasts, I mean, seemingly days. But it's one minute and nine seconds. Um, the crowd don't care. Vinny Vegas wins. Then he says he has the strongest arm in WCW. Minus five stars of uh, that one. That was, that was a shocking segment, let me tell you. But uh, <laughs> what did you? Well, what did you make? <laughs> well, pretty much the same thing. But if you, the, the, uh, Kevin does something right afterwards that I had to chuckle at. Right when he comes up and he does the old. Yes, yes like, it does. Yeah, it was just so typical Kevin Nash. You, know, you have to chuckle at it. Uh, it. You know, if if you're Kevin Nash, what do you do in that spot? I mean, like you, you know, it's it is what it is, and they're going to throw it in there. But I think it does give you a little bit of a look see into the psyche of Bill Watts. You know, you often hear people like me rave about Bill's booking, and. This is one of those things, though, where you can see like those vestiges of those years gone past where fans might have wanted to see an arm wrestling match or whatever. Uh, clearly, this had no place in wrestling in 1993. Uh, the, the business we talked about earlier on the, on the first half of this episode, the, uh, the business was transitioning and it was looking for something. Uh, younger guys, maybe get the older guys back. It was just like, a whole lot of stuff swirling there. And I think part of that was, and, and that's solely Bill's idea, is bringing an arm wrestling match because back in the day, you had two guys, big guys in the bar. Okay, put your hands up, big fellas. Let's see who the, the stronger guy is. Um, you know, and, and, you know, that clearly had Bill's stamp on it. Um, so with everybody, you know, I, I, you know, it's funny that you have to preface it this way, but when you say, like, okay, like with, uh, uh, say, Vince Russo or Eric, Eric uh, Bischoff, and saying, you know, you have to preface by saying, now, you know, I'm not going to, you know, agree with everything they say. There are some things I like, but, and then you give the disclaimer, um, you know, so that like somebody out there doesn't get butt hurt because you said something negative or whatever. Uh, I doubt that there's many people on the planet that believe in every single thing that I believe in and exactly as I believe in them. And the same thing goes with booking. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's neither good nor bad. It just is, you know, so if this is what you would consider to be uh, uh, Eric Bischoff's booking style, and this is Vince Russo's booking style, and this is Jim Cornette's booking style, there's it's all in the eye of the beholder. There, you know, some there will be fans that would say Jim Cornette's a great booker, but would say, "Oh, I can't stand it." Same thing with everybody else. But yeah, that you have to give that disclaimer up front to me. I, I think speaks a lot more as to where the you know where society resides right now. Um, I, 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 as everybody knows out there, I have a very specific taste on wrestling and I love that flavor, uh, of the stuff that I love. And like everybody else, you know, I may not like pistachio ice cream. I may not like this style of booking. That doesn't mean my way's right and their way's wrong. It's just what I would or would not do as a booker. Um, you know, so, uh, there, there's always gonna be that, but you can see this with Bill. Like this is a direct splash back to some much earlier time. You know, we're going to get the two tough guys out there. We're going to do this and it's going to be great. Uh, <laughs> like you said, when seemingly on for days, right? Uh, but, you know, Kevin comes up off that and plays it. as <laughs> Only he could. And, you know, I was telling him, I said, what else could he have done? You know, it's pretty much what you're left to at that point. It's like the video game. There's only so many options, you know, how many, so many buttons you can push or combinations of buttons. Uh, so there's not an unlimited number of possibilities off this juncture in the game. Uh, there's one, two, three, or four, uh, depending on what buttons you push. Same thing here. There's only so many things you can or cannot do after that. But I think it really screams out uh, old time. 
Mm -hmm. right? Like different, different era. Um, and I don't think oh, you look at the wrestling fans, even watching it, like the, the fans that are there in the building. Uh, yeah. You can see the wishy washy look on there. There's no rapture. There's no like, Oh, got to catch all of this. Um, and you know, but again, it, it, it doesn't mean I'm right. And Bill was wrong. It just means that for my personal taste, I think it was completely outdated. And, and in that particular case, it played out like I would have expected it to play out. No, you're completely right. Bill was wrong on that one. Um, DDP wasn't with Vegas, Vinny Vegas, because DDP was out with the torn rotator cuff at the time. If you're wondering, uh, the next match is the Wrecking Crew. Rage and Fury, a.k.a. Al Green, who was actually Kevin Nash's first tag team partner in the Master yes. Blasters. And Fury being Joe and Johnny's brother, Mark the Terminator, Laurinaitis, versus mm, yeah. the Z-Man, Tom Zenk, and Johnny Gunn, um, better known probably as Salvatore Sensei, uh, Tom Brandy. So, cool, that's a lot of uh, you know names to sort of get through to sort of qualify who these yeah. people are, essentially. But this match, you were talking about it before, and there was something that didn't quite jive uh, for you. Well, a lot of it. Uh, uh, you know, Mark got out of the business when he did, uh, you know, it's facing, if you're in the Laurinaitis family, uh, wrestling is at least partially the family business. And, you know, your brothers are making a lot of money off of it. So why wouldn't you come in? And uh, I was showing Moose last night, I'll hold it up here a little closer. Those fingers being broken and, and my knuckles there, that happened in a match with Mark Laurinaitis, uh, the Terminator, in uh, I think it was Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And Ron Simmons would later take me to the hospital that night to to get it fixed up. Uh, he was like like we had said before like about Charlotte, the different people mimicking. Uh, you could see him and Al trying to mimic the Road Warriors, but neither of them had the charisma of, or Mike or Joe. Um, and you know, I think again, this is the kind of thing you see where okay, like Bill trying, okay, we're going to throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. But again, ultimately, when it comes down, these guys, they, they were, in Mark's case, herky-jerky, like unsure of himself, like the start-stop, start-stop. And in Al's case, just the, uh, no pun intended with, with his name, just really green. You know, and so you can only cover that up so much, especially when you're in the match. Um, when they do the top rope bump on uh, uh, Tom Brandy, and it looks just a little bit like rough around the edges. But then when Al goes for the cover on that, I want the fans that are going to go back and watch this. When Al goes for the cover, he starts to drop down and then he spins himself around. And it's just like, he's just sort of like blanketing his body down on the cover. No, it's just a boom, boom, grab the leg, hook, whatever. Uh, and, and those are the things that we veterans will look out for. And, and knowing just by that one thing you see, you can sort of guesstimate pretty closely where this person's skill set is. And, uh, you know, but to the office, they, you know, I'm sure we're, you know, out of respect for Johnny and or Joe or vice versa, um, giving them a look, see, and big, you know, Bill loved big guys. And then, and, and Alan and Mark were both big guys. And then you get in there with, you know, Tom Brandy's not a bad hand and then Sal, uh, uh, Tom Brandy, who's a good hand. Um, and just the chemistry wasn't quite there, and the the greenness sort of oozed off of a good chunk of it. And uh, you know, you, at the end of it, you're like, I was sort of surprised that they put them over yeah. on on uh, uh, Tom and and uh, well, both Tom, Tom Brandy and Tom Zank, uh, because you know they good looking guys, good bodies, good builds. You know, girls loved them, and uh, and it's just like one of those herky quirky weird type things like okay i didn't see that one kind of surprised me um but it, i think again this is this whole episode is really screaming out that wcw was in this phase and they didn't really know what direction to go so they were trying a little bit of this a little bit of that some of it worked some of it didn't and they're just you know the proverbial throwing shit against the wall to see what sticks i was uh, do you know i just had a look on the phone to see if we'd ever talk, talked about Tom Zenk before on a, any of these shows. I don't think we have. Mm -hmm. 1993, as you say, surprising that Tom Zenk lost because, you know, for years he was a mainstay of WCW tag team yeah. partners with Brian Pillman, but he was almost like the Marty Jannetty in a sense of 
throughout the years, for whatever reason, he just seems to just be ever decreasing in the officer's estimations and just having a lesser and lesser role as the years went on. Why with Tom Zanks? He just sort of seemed like he had maybe not everything, I don't know, but he seemed to have enough to, to be a decent star in WCW. Yeah. Uh, again, look at where we were in time. Bill was not especially a fan of, of like, you know, for lack of better terms, the pretty boys. Uh, you know, he saw them as the, you know, dime a dozen type thing. And, uh, you know, good bodies and all that. That meant very little to Bill. Bill's was more about the in-ring product, which begs even further, why would you put these guys over on those guys? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think it, it speaks more about the, the, the biases that, that Bill would have had. Uh, I got two big muscle up guys here, and I got two pretty boys. And Tom, at this time, Tom had uh, – he had been given the ball partially and and then pulled, like you know Dolph Ziggler of his day right They're this start stop start stop start stop but in each of them if you look at the first time he saw Tom and then the last time he saw Tom it didn't it, it looked pretty much like the same guy it didn't look as though he was excelling or or learning you know as he went along the way uh you know, if you look at others uh, in that same group, like you look at Steve Austin when he first came in, Brian Pillman when he first came in, uh, Shane Douglas when he first came in, and you start to see, like, okay, this guy looks better than he looked last week or better than he looked six months ago. I think Tom came in, which I think is part of the curse for the guys that have that, you know, those those really model good looks, you know, that they come in and they get stamped with that. But if it doesn't get over immediately, now it becomes a detriment. So what are you doing? It really doesn't matter if you're a good looking guy or not. Um, you know, they're, they're looking to see like what's growing and how, how vociferously the fans are supporting and uh, wrestling at this time had sort of gone. It was starting to go the way of, yeah, just a, a handsome face and a good body is not enough anymore. It's got to be a little bit more to that. And I think that worked against both of them. Um, at that moment in time, six months earlier, six months later, might have been completely different. But it, again, like each of these matches, you can see that there is a a real vivid and overt attempt to get anything over to find something that works. And you know, you see it through this match, like like when uh, Mick beat uh, Mark Barrow, uh, Johnny B. Bab. That surprised me because I thought. Uh, yeah, it has it has Bill's uh, you know fingerprints all over it, but you know Bill loved heels, and you know Mick you know had that really different. I'm all tangled up here. Had that really different look and unorthodox style. Uh, you know that you know you can see what Bill you know Bill saw in him, and I talked about his his foot placement and everything earlier. But you know Mark looks so much more polished. And, you know, again, for Bill, I think, you know, Bill's that kickback, right? Like, you know, black boots, black tights, and all this other stuff. Mark, four or five years down the road would have been the biggest thing on the planet. Uh, you know, I, I, again, knowing, knowing Bill Watson, like I know him, you can see a lot of what made Bill great as a booker and a lot of what hurt him as a booker. You can see it playing out in this episode. It's like a microcosm of of, of those things. Um well, I, I that that really made no sense to me when I saw uh, Al and, and Mark go over on those guys because you know just looking at them and, and what we're predilected to look at today, you look at it all. Oh, those guys are going to definitely get the push, and then it wasn't that, especially after you see like how herky jerky and green uh, uh, Mark and Alan were. Um, so I don't think it was happenstance that that Mark didn't stick around the business. And I Johnny had told me what he had gone on to, but he had, he had gone on to something that was really successful at that. And, you know, found his calling. So, um, you know, but he gave the family business a try and didn't quite cut it and moved on and was successful in something else. Now, uh, the next few segments I'm going to race through. So Larry Zabisco interviews Brian Pillman and Steve Austin in regards to their tag team championship match against you and Ricky Steamboat. Mm -hmm. Pillman says they will do whatever it takes, while Austin says nothing and laughs in the background. <laughs> right. Tony Schiavone interviews Sting, and then uh, Sting addresses the invitation to the White Castle of Fear. And Dustin, I believe that's a burger joint in America. Someone correct me yeah. if that's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, Dustin yes. Rhodes sneaks up and then slaps him on the back, which sort of like stuns Sting slightly on that, but we'll move on continuing. Larry Zabisco interviews Harley Race with Paul Orndorff, Vader, and Barry Windham and the Barbarian. Harley Race says Cactus Jack is going to pay for putting his hands on him, and then Harley moves Larry out the way and then fires Barbarian. 
for sort of reasons that I don't really understand. I mean, I tried to watch it and I didn't quite understand, but apparently it's because Barbarian was friends with Cactus Jack and then they fired him for that reason. And then yeah. me and uh, I think you as well, and then Jesse Ventura and everybody is confused that why would Harley Race take away his four on three advantage in the Thunder, whatever it is, cage main event? And then we have a commercial for Super Brawl 3, the pay-per-view, and it shows highlights from Super Brawl 2, uh, which is Liger and Pillman in Steamboat versus Root, and Super Brawl 1. Uh, there's a reason why I'm doing it in this way. Uh, the matches mm-hmm. uh, include Flair and Fujinami. But uh, it actually plays pretty much the entire segment from Super Brawl 1 where Missy Hyatt tries to interview Tom Zenk, who we were just talking about, in the shower, but it's actually Stan Hansen with tobo- tobacco dribbling down his face and he spanks <laughs> Missy out the door. And it was just a fun segment. And Missy Hyatt, we haven't talked to, uh, talked, well, I haven't talked to either, talked about on this show. And I really like Missy as a character. I yeah. don't think she gets the props, <clears throat> at least in WCW, of just being a fun character to sort of have all this mm. craziness wrap around her. <clears throat> yes. Keep in mind <clears throat> that Missy, having been married to uh, Eddie Gilbert for quite a while, you know, several years, and was in the UWF with Eddie, married to Eddie, when Eddie was doing the whole hot stuff international and was essentially doing the booking, even though Bill was considered the booker. He was off working to grow the company. And so uh, she had a front row seat to watching Eddie's wheels turn, you know, totally. and, and Eddie was incredibly, Eddie was incredibly uh, uh talented when it came to the storytelling and the character development and uh you know he'd been born and steeped in the business so uh she had a front row seat to that so like when you see the stuff that missy's doing later even after they had split up you know i'm sure she had picked a lot of that stuff up and it gave her a big advantage over a lot of the other people that may not get some of those more nuanced cool things uh you know and, and missy was played as that you know like sort of the dumb blonde thing and I, you know, knowing Missy, I never saw Missy in that respect. Uh, I always knew she was a, you know, intelligent woman. But she also, you know, much like Suzanne Summers, who just passed away, um, on uh, Three's Company, would play this sort of ditzy blonde, you know, airhead uh, that was beautiful on the eyes and played off as being something stupid. Like today, people would take offense at. But <clears throat> yeah, Suzanne Summers, she'd probably give an awful lot of credit to that silly role. And then afterwards comes off and shows, you know, her, her business acumen with the whole thigh master thing and, uh, you know, kept herself relevant for a whole long time after, you know, that one sitcom. So, uh, I think Missy far, far much in that same vein <clears throat> that she, uh, you know, when, when she would go and was involved in say the announcing WCW saw her as an announcer, as a woman announcer. Uh, but, She's also getting to sit in these in these booking meetings and hearing, you know, all the inner workings and stuff. And I think Missy was smart enough instead of just going, I have an idea and blurting it out the table. She would wait till the, the meeting broke up and say, Hey, Bill, let me talk to you for a second, you know, about this one thing or that one thing. Uh, you know, and get her two cents put into the mix that way. Um understood where society was at the time and was capable enough to to get her voice heard. Whereas most people would think in wrestling in that time and and you know in that stage of wrestling, the early nineties, <clears throat> nobody would listen to Missy. Missy wouldn't have a voice, right? Because if you listen to the memes today, uh, Missy had to work at it a little bit harder than she would may, maybe have to do today. But she was smart enough to know that she couldn't just raise her hand at the table or shouldn't just raise it at the table because it'd be summarily dismissed. Instead, could go directly to, you know, and there's a way, you know, in this business, and I think a lot of other businesses where I can drop an idea to you and get you to finally start saying, like, you think it's your idea, mm-hmm. uh, but it's my idea, you know, being put through you. And, you know, I think Missy did an awful lot of that. Uh, I don't know if she would fess up to that, uh, but, you know, Missy was was crafty that way. And she was smart enough to understand what the lay of the land was at that time. And to somehow traverse her, her way through that, uh, to not just be a pretty blonde and an, a ditzy airhead that we can throw on air, uh, that Missy, there was a lot more to Missy under the hood than than most people would give credit for. And I credit a lot of that, both to her natural intelligence, but also to having been married to Eddie Gilbert. You know, Eddie would, I'm sure, nightly be sitting down and 
doing bouncing stuff off of her and you know and and so that would give a real unique insight into somebody on the outside seeing how somebody on the inside of our business crafts this stuff and you know eddie was one of those guys like i said i've always put on a pedestal as being really smart to the business and understanding it and she had a front row seat for that for how many years they were married three four five whatever it was and uh she is credited with coming up with half of shane douglas's name so uh when i first got down there and sting we'd said a couple episodes ago about sting uh, being the first person i met there he and his wife sue uh went over to eddie's house uh he and missy's house and he not interviewed me i know he'd already hired me but it's now he's asking me like for input and you know do you want to use a stage name or do you want to use a you know a, your real name and i so what's the difference i <laughs> i'm green i don't know the difference i mean i know what a stage name is but i don't know what why is that different than my real name and he said, uh, well, if so, if you use a real name, anybody can call the hotel. So they bring me through to Troy Martin's. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't want that. Um, so I said, okay, I'm thinking like either Shane or Cody. And I said, well, I like Shane better than Cody. So we sat there, he and I, and Missy for a while, she ended up getting up and going into the kitchen. We're coming up with every incarnation of Shane Martin, Troy Shane Martin, Shane Martin, you know, uh, 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 all these different incarnations of plugging this name in here, here, middle name, last name. Does it fit? And nothing sounded right. Uh, and Missy had gone into the kitchen to make lemonade. <clears throat> and when you walked into their dining room from their kitchen, there was a wrought iron, like ivy thing right there and i can still see her in my mind's eye walking through that wrought iron carrying a, a tray and she turns the corner and she walks into the room and she goes how about shane douglas and we both listened to her, both looked at each other and i was like sounds like a real name shane douglas it flows uh you know and, and that's where shane douglas came from so when you're people she came up with my name that's how partially right uh we had tried every kind of incarnation of the of the name shane and nothing sounded right until Shane Douglas, and that's where Shane Douglas was born. Um, and I, I think a lot of that is based off of Missy's sitting there and watching Eddie mm -hmm. booking and creating things and coming up with things. Uh, so, yeah. And, and you know, I had said a couple episodes ago about uh, Tammy being that first diva, right? Well, there were, really was divas before. They weren't called divas. But, uh, you know, the, the UWF had uh, uh, Missy Hyatt. They had Dark Journey, and they were using these beautiful women in much more substantial roles than just women wrestlers or just a women ballet, or, or they were a little bit more, you know. And and so that I I think you have to credit the UWF and Bill Watts with, you know, with all of his foibles that we've all talked about, that he was a lot more forward thinking than I think many today would give him credit for. Because it really was the UWF that first started using women in those more prominent rules that weren't just the more traditional, okay, this is like Moolah, we're going to make her a wrestler, or oh, let's put it on the ringside, make her look pretty, and, and put her out there with so-and-so or whoever. Uh, they were actually figured in, and and uh, Dark Journey was uh, the, the Missing Links manager, mm -hmm. and uh, Tammy, or I mean, uh, Missy was seconding Eddie going down to the ring, part of Hot Stuff International, and uh, they were by those standards in those days, vastly different than what r women's wrestling had been prior and vastly different than what would come later in the form of divas. But I would argue that the 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 platform that the divas are built on in some parts started with like the uh, the baby dolls and the dark journeys and the Missy Hyatts. That was what gave rise to it. Now, the... The main event in our eyes for this podcast, but there's another <laughs> match afterwards. The champions, and th this is its own question, actually. Uh, Ricky Steamboat and Shane Douglas versus the Hollywood Blondes, Brian Pillman and Steve Austin. Now, you are the unified tag team champions. So I was looking at them originally thinking, well, they're not the US belts, so what belts are they? But they're the NWA belts as well as the WCW belts. Yes. Uh, it's really, really confusing at this point, the old NWA, WCW thing. Do you remember winning the NWA belts? I do. Yes. They, I remember being uh, called the unified world tag team champions. And uh, of course we had to carry the belts back then. The company didn't cart them around. 
And so, like, one belt's a pain in the ass. Two's just a downright <laughs> rib, right? You know, you got all this extra weight in your bag. Uh, but this was, and we at that moment in time, I don't think any of us knew that the NWA part was going to be jettisoned and it would just become WCW. Uh, in large part because it had such a lineage and such a history to it uh, that that really lent gravitas to, to to any of the titles and to the promotion itself. So, like, when we're doing that, it was like our thought that this was going to be like an ongoing thing. Um, and I, I don't know how long or how soon after that, that they would drop the unified part of it in the NWA part. But that was, uh, I don't ever recall Ricky and I having that discussion as to, did he know that they were going to do this? And could he, whether he was told or could figure it out. Uh, I just think we, we both felt that this was going to be, you know, the, this is the run. It's the world unified tag team champions. Now uh, I've written half a page worth of review of the match. You don't need me to say anything about it. Because, I mean, when was the last time you watched this? Was it 2025? Have you even ever watched it back? I think I watched it back around the time that it happened. Uh, you know, we'd have people that, that, you know, would film in the old VCR tapes, film you know, tape stuff for you. I don't remember watching it since, only because I think, like not long after that, I'd be in ECW and be coming this heel character. And uh, although I knew Ricky had taught me a huge amount uh, uh, about being upper card, in my naivete at that point, I didn't see the connection of what I was learning to being Ricky Steamboat's partner going to be helpful to me being this this ultra heel character. Uh, but when I watched those matches back, much like the one we did a few weeks ago, uh, you know, I'm always in awe of, of, of Steamer. Um, just you just watch him, and it's uh, like, for instance, in that match, watch how many times he teases in vastly different ways the hot tag, right? To where then you find he's going to get it, he does it, and then there's this double take and a double trip around, and then the German suplex, belly to back suplex, and they're both down, and then the hot tag comes to go into the. But he had teased it four or five, six times before that. So through 75% of his heat, it was him continually trying to get to the tag, trying to get to the tag, which is what it is. It's tag team wrestling. You're getting your ass kicked, your fresh partners on the apron. So even though you know you're not going to make the tag, he's that's the point. He's got to get over and make the tag. So he, again, just, just like a maestro playing an orchestra, you just watch how seamlessly he does this. And there's even times because like Brian could get a little bit unorthodox you know, and, and Steve too, in a different way. Uh, but you know, where he's almost crowding Ricky, he's not letting Ricky do his typical sell. He'd do something, get right back on him and do something, get right back on him. And, but even in the middle of that, you can see steamboat still selling and, you know, trying to get it in. And to me, that looks legit. You know, if, if you were trying to beat this legend, you'd stand on like stink on shit. Right. And, uh, yeah. And, and they do that. Uh, both of them, uh, but the, the, just the, the myriad of ways that Ricky feigns making the hot tag without making the hot tag. And by the way, each time he does that, the crowd gets <laughs> a little, a little bit, a little bit more. It's just doing this, each one, pulling that energy up just ever so slightly higher. And then to where finally, boom, gets it. Now the place blows. Credit Steamboat for all, <laughs> from the three of us. That was all steamer. Um and you know, being his partner was easy once you you know you got used to those little things that he would do like that. Because you know, if you notice, like on the first couple, I'm not really working the apron. Like, come on, come on, you're getting closer, you're getting closer. Because I know what he's doing in that moment in time. I'm looking back at it, I, I forget, but I'm looking. Okay, this is why I'm not working the apron. See, I'm I'm quiet back there and doing very little. But then when he gets closer to him, you see me start to bang because you know, I know it's coming then. And uh, you know, again, credit Steamboat with that. Uh, on Brian and Steve's work, there's, uh, as great heels there, especially in tag team matches, you get the opportunities to get the upper hand. And today we see it as, as this quadrennial thing, right? So we're going to have a shine at the beginning. We're going to have a heat. We're going to have a comeback and then we're going to have a go home and boom, 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 boom. So I've just told you how many times steamboat teases the tag. But watch how many times during whether it's our shine or our heat uh, uh, comeback, 
You know, Brian at the one point gives me the shoulder to cut me off, goes to jump in. I power slam him out of that false count. One, two, here comes uh, into, you know, feeds right in off the tag. Watch off of that tag. Uh, Brian makes it over to his corner, makes the tag. Steve comes in. I'm still down on the mat for a millisecond. You think he's rushing me. He's going a little bit too fast, but watch where he positions himself as he comes to the ropes right into the drop toe hold. And as he takes the face bump down, watch what he does with his left arm. He hits the mat and then he goes, because he knows the arm bar's coming, right? And it's just, it's not a telegraph. It's not like so obvious what he's doing. It, it's almost a little boom down on his face, arms out, grab the arm bar. Uh, it's just putting everything where it needs to be. That ring generalship that for a baby face makes it super duper easy. And uh, when you watch their positioning, because a lot of those stuff, especially with Steamboat, was always timing and spacing. And, uh, you know, when Steamer finally makes the go over, the bell of the back, and then there's the, the pause, the pause, the pause. He comes up almost half to the wrong corner, makes the tag, perfect spacing. And each time, watch the audience as he's doing this. Each time the crowd's coming a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And then when he starts going to the, to the other side, one of the guys in the audience does this. Shit, he's going to the mm -hmm. wrong quarter, right? That's when you know you got them. You got you got that fish right on the hook, just yanked it in, into their jaw. And uh, Brian and Steve coming in, they both have unorthodox styles. Uh, Brian was a lot more just throw it out there, throw it out there, rush you, maybe maybe pinch you a bit at points. But even in that, it, it gave it an air of legitimacy because this is what if we were really champions, uh, this is what you would be doing. You know, if you were fresh and you're in there, you'd be pushing it and rushing it and getting your stuff as much as you can. But in the middle of all that, Brian will set up some place where he gets caught with a power slam coming from inside or outside. Steve comes in, steps right into the top, the, the drop toe hold, feeds his arm up, boom. And the whole time, like Steve's moving his legs, he looks really unorthodox. But in each of those things he's doing, he's putting himself right in the perfect positions to be the shortest route between two points. And, you know, when you watch that as a performer, you're just watching you're like, mm, man, impressive. Just really, really good stuff. By the way, you said about the promo prior and Steve sitting there, you know, the, you know, the big old ding, ding, you know, you almost see the tooth gleam, like in the, you know, the little star ging you know, on his teeth. That was Steve doing his handsome Steve, right? <laughs> be the handsome guy sitting here and say nothing. Uh, just, you know, good, good memories of working with those guys. And then when you watch it back, like, you know, even like I said about those hot tag fanes earlier, you can see it. Like, watch Brian and Steve. Like, okay, you know what Steve was going to do. I just described it. But watch them. It looks like the entire time they're trying to keep him from tagging. And even as it gets close, everything looks like it fits right into place. The puzzle fits right together. There's no like, okay, where did this come from? Uh, why would they do that? Um, everything you're watching those guys do is perfect positioning, perfect timing. And even where it looks a little bit uh, unorthodox or cattywampus, they're always in the right place. They always know where their partner is. They all, they, you know, today you'll see a baby face, you know, he'll bump a baby face and then they'll turn around and jaw jack the audience. Meanwhile, the baby face is two feet from his corner. Why doesn't he just reach up and tag? Why doesn't the partner just reach in and tag the shoulder? Something. Uh, the air of legitimacy to it. And, and the reason is because we talked about it earlier, and that's not where I'm supposed to tag yet. Uh, you know, it's like when you're playing golf, it's play it where it lays. You don't get to move the ball where you want to. And the same thing here. But when you're with two heels that can so perfectly position themselves, when I we, there's the one spot where uh, Steve gets on me, shoots me in, and I – do the, the jump in the blind, throw my back into him, come off like a turn, like a cross body block, but I don't turn. It's just into the turnbuckle and push straight back out. You're completely blind to where your opponent is. You, you, he might be in the other corner for all you know. There was never a time I could, we did it almost nightly. There was never a time I did that move with Steve Austin that I thought to myself, Oh, I hope he's there. I hope he's there. I hope he's there. He was always there. He was always right where he needed to be. And boy, when you like I said, as a baby face, we're in the ring with guys like that. It's taking candy from babies, right? I mean, just go out and do it. They're going to be there, um, you know. And Steamboat and I, uh, Toronto, I, I hate to say it like this because it sounds like I'm being like, you know, 
weren't we great? Um, it, it, it's not that, but I'm watching it, and it you can almost see the reverence I have for Ricky. But then, like when it gets real, you know, we're doing the forearm bumps and and you know holding our own with these guys. Uh, I when I'm watching it anyway, I, there's no time I get a feeling like these guys aren't really a team. Like they they feel like a team. Just those s- s- meaningless in and outs. Tag in on the arm. Take it. Tag back in. Come off the top on the arm. Tag come back and kick the arm. It's nothing. You're just doom, 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 uh, in and out, in and out, in and out. But it gives the fans the feel. Oh, these guys are a well-oiled machine, right? They're they're you know these guys know what they're doing. Um, and uh, I, I think for all four of us to give the pat on the back to all four of us is when you watch the finish of that match. At no time do you walk away from it and go, ah, I was good up to this point, or this was a little weak. Everything comes across and it's digestible. Like everything makes sense and it's and it fits right in there. And again, I, I credit Ricky because I had a great, a great lead character to play off of, and I had two incredible heels that I I don't think it's happenstance that Steve Austin went on to be like one of the iconic faces in wrestling. I think if Brian not died, he, he would have been right there alongside him. He'd have had a monster run somewhere. Those guys were great, great heels, and they had fun doing it. They looked like they're having fun doing it. And that that bleeds off. I I think I can pronounce it a lot better than say an average fan could. But I think the fans, why when you watch the audience, there's nobody in there like looking at their watch or bored or something. the audience is into it. And, and each of the things that Steamboat is laying out, the false tags and the the feigning getting to the corner each time the crowd is <laughs> oh and the guy doing this and they're into it. And when the final hot tag finally does come. There's the pop. That's the gar- That's the that's the validation that you had them where you thought you had them that you wanted to have them. And for me, Brian and Steve, at that uh, inception points of our rise to, in, the, in the main event, we had perhaps the greatest teacher in wrestling teaching us. So uh, you know, it's uh, we you know in hindsight, any wrestling fan can say, well, the franchise was big in ECW. Boy, Steve Austin became that huge character, and Brian Pillman, everybody would believe, would have been in any of those roles. Uh, and you look at it, and you can see like a lot of that learning was taking place right there in matches like that on a night to night basis. You know, again, credit the Steamboat, uh, credit to Steamboat and Steamer. Incredible. Uh, with that being said, Shane Douglas and Ricky Steamboat via DQ win 13 minutes 39 because uh, Austin, okay, well, I think it was Austin. I've got so many lights in my face now that I like I can't <laughs> even read my own writing here. But uh, yeah, Austin goes to the floor, gets the tag belt, and wipes you out for the disqualification. Pillman and Austin continue to uh, attack you. You're busted wide open. Then uh, Pillman whips Steamboat a couple of times really hard. It looks oh. like as well with the tag team belt uh, before yes. the baby faces make the save. Uh, that didn't look like. Was that oh. was that even planned? Because it just looked like Pillman just decided to take advantage of that very very quickly and then escape. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I don't believe for a second that Brian meant to hurt him. I, I just don't think he thought. He's like, oh, I got the belt, I should whip him with it, right? Mm. And not realizing or understanding there's a metal plate mm. on the, there's a metal edge on the end of those belts uh, that, and you can see Ricky, like, really, just, like, you don't see him Ricky Steamboat sell it. It's just like, oh, and it tense, and it looks right up at Brian, right? Uh, but it's funny how you said that because as we were watching last night, Moose, popped on that like, oh you know because he knows he, he knows what a belt looks like and how how it is and he knows ricky uh you know but again like those types of things and there and there were times i think i told you before in joe lewis arena where they were supposed to afterward we beat them they beat us down afterwards they're supposed to have the belts above us and like real cockily lay them on our chests and instead they both get wrapped up in this and they both toss them just haphazardly with the one chipped Ricky's tooth and busted my lip. And Ricky, who is <laughs> the nicest guy in wrestling, right? Uh, I think this is the only time I'd ever seen him in something wrestling related. <laughs> no, enough said about that. Uh, <laughs> that he blew. Uh, they, they it literally was as Rick, uh, as uh, Brian and Steve were through the ropes and going down. Rick, now, we're supposed to be laying there selling, right? Ricky looks at me, let's go, partner. And he jumps up, and we're literally like eight feet behind them. And I'm behind Steamboat. We get into that dressing room, and Steamer just laid into them. Of course, he's pissed, chipped his tooth, busted my lip. We're laying there prone for you. And, uh, again, I don't think that Brian or Steve did it intentionally. I think they were just so wrapped up in character 
Uh, and I think that's the same thing that happened with the, the belt whipping last night. But I, you know, watching it, mm. that had to hurt. Uh, now we get a video package of Vader versus Ron Simmons. A house show from Baltimore, Maryland. Vader works on Simmons' shoulder and wins clean with the shoulder breaker to regain the WCW World Championship. He lost to Simmons back in August in the same building. Did you know that Ron Simmons wasn't meant to lose the title in that building? He was meant to lose it the night before in uh, Philly uh, to Vader, yeah. and Ron Simmons <laughs> just didn't turn up. Uh, he yeah, just missed the shot. I, Do you, what happened? Uh, his wife, um, oh my God, your name's again. Um, Oh, it was really nicely. What the hell is her name? It'll pop in my head in a second. Uh, she was having really bad headaches. And I think they thought that she might be having a stroke or something. And so he had taken her to the hospital. I mean, of course, I mean, this is more important, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the night that it happened, there was some really tense moments in the, in the building uh, because, you know, we're, we're all, anybody knows Ron knows he's just sweetheart of a guy and uh, Lonnie. And there you go. That's his wife's name. Um, you know, I, I, now that I'm trying to think of the name of the guy that uh, he was the attorney that used to do, do production or uh, promotion works for, um, for W NWA, then later WCW and later ring of honor. Uh, Gary Juster um, came in and said that Ron had called, had to take Lonnie to the hospital. She might be having a stroke. And that quickly turned into anger in the office. You know, again, these guys like Bill and these guys came from the point like, hey, your dad's funerals today? Sorry, Steve. You know, we need you here. Um, and, you know, anybody that knows Ronnie knows that <laughs> he loves Lonnie. He's going to take care of his wife. And, uh, you know, it turned into a, like, I'm going to find him this much. I'm going to find him that much. And it kept ramping up and it wasn't like all in front of us there. We were all sitting there listening to stories, uh, Bill telling stories when he gets this message. And now it becomes like a seething in the, uh, not just Bill, certain people in the office that, uh, what they're going to do to Ron to teach Ron a lesson. And I remember thinking, I thinking like, you know, you, you try to teach Ron a lesson when he was worried about his wife and. You know, Ron is a sweet, sweet guy, but you sure as hell don't want him pissed off at you. And, uh, you know, and so then, of course, he didn't make the show that night. And the next day, this happens. And uh, uh, those of us in the dressing room saw it for exactly what it was. Like, this is like, okay, this is garbage, right? It's not like, hey, he took the night off last night because, you know, his daughter wanted to throw snowballs in the front yard. Um, you know, they, they, they were really concerned for, for Lonnie's health. And uh, and Ronnie showed that he had his, his uh, uh, principles in the right place and his concerns in the right place. And thank God it wasn't a stroke. And, uh, you know, I forget what the outcome was, but, you know, Lonnie would later be fine, thank God. And uh, he would lose this belt uh, at, at that time. I don't think, and again, this, this is not anybody's fault, but I don't think at that moment in time, again, how we always talk about the contemporary lens, that you know you got a predominantly African American city, you have, you know, the first African American world heavyweight champion legitimized by a major promotion. What that meant, uh, and I, and I, and I'm sure at that moment in time nobody was even thinking from that perspective, as to okay, if you're going to do this, maybe you can find a better place to do it. Not that you want to pander. But you also don't want the, the city all pissed off, especially if this story leaks out as to why Ron wasn't there. Now you got a real, real black mark, you know, on you know, on, on the company that would undoubtedly turn some number of fans off. And uh, but you know, at that moment in time, I'm thinking just looking at hey, we have a show to run here. Uh, our world champion can't be here for whatever reason, no matter how valid or invalid. And so we're gonna do this, I I guess, to teach a lesson, to punish to do whatever. And I don't think that it, uh, uh that it was as ill meaning as it looked, uh, just again, cause I know the business, how the business was then. And, you know, with the mindset, like I said, Steve Austin or Steve Williams had to miss his father's funeral because he had a, a defense that night. So, um, you know, that, for the fans out there that, you know, 
when you hear wrestlers talk about it, you'll never hear a wrestler complain about this stuff. We sign on with this with full knowledge of what we're doing. But when you, you know, for any of the parents out there, I want you to understand like how special was it when you saw your kids first steps, heard their first words, saw them blow out that candle with a number one on it. Uh, that first Christmas, they come down in the magic of that wrestlers by and large missed most, if not all of that, because we're on the road. And again, nobody complains about that. But then when something comes up, like, you know, your wife may be having a stroke uh, there, you know, this is a serious deal. Uh, there are those of us that, you know, again, this, we see this, this fork in the road and the differing bid. This is old school, new school, go in different ways. Old school, you never missed a shot. But in the new school, this is a reality. I, this is my wife. This is somebody I love dearly. And she's in a bad way. I can't say, hey, honey, I'll stop back and check on you tomorrow if you're still alive. I got to go defend a title in, in this wrestling business. Um, you know, but again, in that moment in time, I, I can see, I get where they were coming from in the sense that I understand what that business was. And, and, you know, like I said earlier about uh, earlier episode about Vince McMahon and not, you know, still running it the same way. Some of those things from the old school are very solid business uh, reasonings for them. And some of them are just total bullshit like that. You know, you can't beat your dad's funeral or, you know, uh, all those other things that you see. So, uh, but yeah, I do remember that vividly uh, and, and sitting there and watching, I think the mindset of us listening as the office was ramping up, uh, I'm going to find him this much. We'll find him that we're, we're going to do this to him. We're going to do that to him. I thought, <laughs> good luck. Cause man, you do that to Ron, he's liable to tear your face off. Uh, and, and Ronnie was pretty capable of doing that at the time. Not that he was that kind of person, but he, uh, he was a tough guy. So, um, yeah, just, you know, the, you know, again, like look at, look at the, the, the changing face of the business. And I think that's one of those older vestiges of old school wrestling. And as much the fans know, I have an affinity for old school wrestling. Uh, those types of things to me really have no place, especially in 2023, let alone, uh, other dates, you know, so, but yeah, I was there for that. <laughs> Ron Simmons was fined $2,000. Yeah. And you. that, the, the night before that had gone as high as 10,000. Oh, really? We're going to find him 2,000. We're going to find him 25. And it kept ramping up like, and, and more than each of them would keep throwing it in. They were like all trying, it's like trying to top each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I will find, I'll find him 10,000 bucks. I like, <laughs> You find Ron ten thousand bucks, you're liable to be dead tomorrow night. So it's <laughs> not that I'm saying Ron would have murdered somebody, but yeah, you know it. Uh, uh, just a tough time, and, and I think in large part in the dress room that sat really like a lead balloon because Ronnie had the respect of the dressing room. You know, Ronnie was a very likable guy, uh, easy to get along with, um, hell of a pro, and. You know, this is just one of these things that happens in life. You know, I, I'm not planning on an asteroid falling on my car right now, but if it does, I got to go to the rental car counter. Um, you know, it's just those things that happen in life. And and again, I think that's where you're starting to see like those last crossovers of old school to new school were like starting to fray and snap. And, and some of them for better, some of them for worse. And that was one of the ones for worse. Now we're going to the uh, actual main event, Thunder Cage match, Dustin Rhodes, Sting and Ron Simmons, who is now being attacked by Vader uh, and then doesn't turn up to the main event. So I don't know if that was part of the punishment that Bill Watts was also sort of laying in that it sort of cost him a clash payoff or whatever. Versus yeah. Big Van Vader, Barry Windham and Paul Orndorff, originally on three on three. No, it was originally four on four, then four on three, then three on three, now two on three. <laughs> Uh, Ron Simmons has been taken out of the main events. Now, I sort of teed you up uh, on the last episode we were talking about Clash of why Cactus Jack was turned into a babyface. So mm -hmm. suddenly it was because there was talk of Terry Funk replacing Ron Simmons in the match that never happened. Funk decided against <laughs> returning to WCW because they recently showed the Ric Flair Terry Funk I Quit match on TV as a repeat, but they edited, edited it to make it look like Flair had been dominant throughout so funk figured if that's how they're going to book him and uh yeah. and then have him re-debut on the losing team then he might as well just not bother uh hence yeah. why cactus turned babyface so quickly and then as i say the match starts out two out three uh, sorry two on three but it's a cage match with traditional tag team rules which was sort of a bit odd even yeah. though it's no disqualification yeah i i thought it was very confusing 
Um, and I always tell people if I can't, if I'm having trouble making heads or tails of this, uh, I'm guessing the fans themselves are. Uh, you have a cage for some reason, but the cage becomes meaningless because someone can just get into the cage. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hated the cage. Excuse me. Having all that space on the floor because it takes the cage sort of out of the match. Mm-hmm. Um, just a, just a whole weird vibe on the setup of that. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Mick comes down. And the thing I noticed, and I, I'm, I can't remember in, in, in context, when Mick comes down, first of all, when he wins the match earlier that night, and then when he comes down, he gets very much the babyface pop. And, uh, you know, like in the match earlier with Mark Merrow, he was sort of the heel. And yet, even like, you know, before Mark Merrow came out, like he was getting popped. And uh, so I, I can't remember in context that had they started that babyface turn. And if so, why would you have in a match with a, you know, with one of your coming babyfaces? It just like we've been saying throughout this these episodes, it, it's just a whole lot of herky jerky. Makes sense, doesn't make sense. It's this person's in, that person's out. Um, well, who got the pin? I couldn't. Who got the pin? Oh, uh, it was uh, Cactus was, Jack. No, he was not in the match, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just See, and it, so every I, I even think the fans were just like, huh, yeah. And completely off the subject, what the hell kind of boots was Sting wearing? Oh, I didn't even notice him. What what, what was he wearing? They they were like a, a teal electric blue like bootlet, like like dress shoes. And I thought, well, why is he? In a, like, you know, you come to a, a, a age, but I'm wondering if he's like they lost his bag or didn't have his boots or something because it just looked. Completely out of place. I'm looking, going like, who wears dress shoes to a to a street fight? You know, to a bar, to a uh, a steel cage match. But the cage itself was sort of rendered meaningless. Uh, you pointed out Mick wins the match. He wasn't even a contestant in the match. Uh, did Barbarian come down anywhere in it? No, Barbarian's and, completely you know, disappeared. So he was fired, and then just didn't even get any revenge or anything. Yeah. I mean, all that is so ill placed that, you know, when you go back and like when I watched the segment much earlier, them turning on on Barb, uh, what seemed ill placed was okay, this guy's been a heel and he's on your heel stable. Now you're going to beat him down and, you know, and do this stuff to him. You know, I doubt there's anybody in the audience with much sympathy. Well, okay, well, it serves him right. You know, it's, uh, uh, it just seems so so odd. Like there's no sympathy going to go there. Uh, if you're going to turn him babyface, uh, that's probably not the best way to do it. You leave him land, and then have him not even get involved in that match later on. It again, it just seemed like let's. Oh, that one didn't stick. Let's try another. <laughs> that one. Oh, that one. Oh, no, it didn't stick either. Let's try another one. And uh, you know, it's when and watching this one again, like these. I don't want to sound like I'm making just critical remarks just for the sake of giving critical remarks because there were some bright spots in this. I mean, you could, you know, Mark Merrow makes a, a debut. I don't think it hurt him at all to put Mick over, uh, came out and, and, you know, was he really able to evoke that character? Um, you know, there were, there were some solid bats. I think, uh, Brian, uh, or Brad Armstrong and, uh, 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 Chris Benoit was a solid match, a very good match. I said there were bright spots all over this show, but then there were also these things at the end. Where said, like scratch your head, going, like, "Why did they do that?" Like it just seemed like a whole lot of time wasted in a direction for no real purpose. And uh, you know, I think that can sometimes happen when you're in this stage of trying to retool, and you know, one of your big guns isn't there, and somebody else is renegotiating, and somebody else is. Yeah, it's you know, I can sympathize with the booking side of it to an extent, but when you look at that overall, there were, you know, two steps forward, three steps back, one step forward, two steps back. It was like a, like this back and forth, back and forth type of thing, and the show never really seemed to grab any kind of a direction. It never felt like okay, boom, now we're launching. It just this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way, and that ain't a good way to book. Uh, I'd, I'd one more, there's a couple more things I want to uh, tell you about Sting or ask your opinion on Sting. Did you see Paul Orndorff's shoot German suplex on Sting? 
Yes. He just walked in, just grabbed him, went, just see you later. And I was like, crikey, yeah. do you owe me money? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 who knows? There were so many of these types of things that went on. And again, like I, I think I mentioned earlier, in one of the episodes, uh, you're you're paying close attention to your stuff, and you're not really paying much attention to all the other because every night there's a thousand and one soap opera stories going on in the dressing room. But also in that kind of a move in the German, like there's only two things that you can do there. Like once somebody's got your waist cinched, you either go with it or you don't. You you squat down out of it. And you know, I think Stingley, all of us are in the mindset of. You know, you're in the match. Somebody's got you. You know, if you, if you squat down, it's going to look really awkward, unorthodox. And, you know, you know, uh, Paul was, you know, I was pointing out to Chris last night. My God, his, you know, he was built like, he looked honest to God like those Greek statues you look at. And uh, it just was a you know, perfect specimen. And obviously, you know, incredibly strong. Uh but in a match where you have multiple people fighting around the ring and things going all over the place, you don't typically do those kind of throws and stuff because you have no idea people behind you where they are. They watch it and stand out of the way for you, or you, know, you just come in and grab somebody and throw them like that. You know, you might throw them onto somebody, you might throw them into somebody. Uh, dangerous, you know. It just uh, all of it seemed dangerous, and it seemed. Almost to me as if like Paul was doing that to make a statement. Because if you notice, right afterwards, Paul goes back to selling and feeding, and you know, so it, it's did they have it worked out? And I, I didn't pay attention to where everybody else was in the ring, but uh, uh, you know, just not an advisable thing to do when you have that many different bodies in the ring. Uh, I want to make one more brief mention. You said Sting's boots. I somehow I missed them. I did notice Cactus Jack's sort of street gear of tights boots t-shirts and neckerchief which i thought was uh <laughs> going, but it's more like a desert scarf sort of thing i suppose uh one more thing about the match but sort of was going to tail off into uh the uh, a question really is that sting seemed to have punch one type of punch for paul orndorff and then a different type of punch for vader and what i mean by that is he just really just seemed to just be clumping vader uh, when I, I don't know how many times if you ever did wrestle vader in fact did you ever wrestle vader Yes, yeah. We, Steamer, Steamer and I wrestle him and Rick Rude quite often, in fact. With that being said, Vader, uh, is it? Is did he encourage you to hit him as hard as possible? Because obviously he was going to hit you pretty darn hard. Or was it just yeah, something well, that we sort of had to gain his respect in a kind of sense in that way? I, I think so. That that was a bit of it. Uh, but he didn't take when he would get you in the corner and he would do the right, left, right, left, right, left. It'd be right, left, right, left, right, left, left, left. Or, you know, so there'd be like a, throw, a hiccup in there. And so by the time you get into the rhythm of going to the right and the left and the right and the left, all of a sudden you walk right into one, you know, and, uh, you know, you never really said anything. It wasn't like he was tatering you. He was just catching you pretty good. A good, sol good solid hit, excuse me. Um, and I never saw him complain, uh, you know, about getting ones. Uh, I think with Sting, you know, he, Sting and him had worked quite extensively. They, you know, they'd go around the the loop. Uh, and uh, I think I told that story before about how they wanted to go on before the semi man because Ricky would take us out there and you know put a forty five fifty minute match on a clinic. Uh, you and, not, uh, not said that story, I don't think, with us. Yeah, this was the first time in, in, in WCW and NWA history where the semi-main went on after the main event. Uh, and it was mostly house shows. <clears throat> but they would go out, they had like a good six, seven, eight-minute match. They'd go on, bat, 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 finish, done, and out. Um, and Ricky would go out there uh, and take us out there. And all uh, the, that 13-minute match we, we had a, uh, on this show, that was a very anomalous. Uh, we typically never went less than 40, 45. It was pretty much a nightly thing. We were going to put the marathon in. And, uh, you know, so they they turned the tables on us. They they go and get this change. The main goes on before the semi-main. Well, the crowd have now seen the main event. They're ready to go. And so I remember the first night that it happened, we were, I want to say, in Savannah. It was somewhere in Georgia. And the agent was Grizz and uh, grizzly smith and he came up to ricky and me and he said okay ricky tonight it's you and shane versus brian and steve uh uh 
10, 12 minutes, take it home. And Ricky went like this. And I knew what that meant. I remember going 55 tonight because Ricky believed, and again, veteran wise, veteran uh, smarts, that he knew that that time in the ring was the time that you got to advertise you, advertise your wares. And so if you'll give, he said, they'll give you 10, try to get 12. And so when he gave me that look, I knew exactly what it meant. So, you know, w- me, Brian, and Steve, I'm guessing all three of us were saying, ah, hell, let's do what Grizz said. 10, 12 minutes to get out of it. They've already seen the main event. Ricky knew it's going to take us some amount of time to get the crowd reinterested. And so we would go out and there'd be a whole lot of pushing and shoving and backing them away. And this would go on for five, six, seven, eight minutes. And during that time, you'd see the crowd going from like, oh, da, da. And also they'd start, you know, paying attention and a little bit more. And then at some point shortly after that, when Ricky thought it was right, he'd say, okay, let's start it. Ding, ding, ding. And we have him. And he would start from there and do, do whatever typical match steamer was going to lay out for us. Uh, uh, I plead ignorance. I would have never known to do that at that stage. Um, I'm pretty sure Brian and Steve wouldn't have. And yet somehow that wily veteran knew that he could get that crowd back and, and did, you know, so it was the first and only time in WCW history that the semi main went on after the main and, uh, and Ricky helped us not drop that ball, uh, took us and the audience for a ride. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I do it quite often on here and I'm going to always do it. Like I'm, I'm in total law of Ricky, uh, and the things that he could do. Like, again, most people in the business, especially today, would say, shit, why are we going 50 if we can go 10? Uh, well, that's why. That's 40 more minutes you get to advertise your wares. And, uh, you know, true genius to the business. So the show ends with Cactus Jack cutting a promo on the bad guys and being way over his head. And then he's sort of, you know, getting new friends in. Cactus Jack also says nobody can stop him and threatens Paul Orndorff for their upcoming match. Then Cactus climbs the cage, credits roll. Good night, Cactus, uh, I think Jim Ross says. And then the credits roll. Yeah. Uh, the postscript to all this is, I was just looking through my notes here. I've got another two pages of no, sorry, just a no. Sorry, actually, only a page and a bit of postscripts. We'll probably refer to a couple of things, and then we'll shut this podcast down. In the credits, I'm sure you weren't watching the credits very carefully. There was a get well to a chap called Robbie Kanoff. Do you remember that name? Yes. Yeah, remember well. Robbie Kanoff was the vice president uh, uh, of San Francisco Toys. Mm-hmm. He would be instrumental in bringing ECW the uh, the deal to put the action figures out. Uh, at this time, Robbie Kanoff was uh, palling around with Flair. And uh, the infamous story is that he had three times uh, Flair had supposedly gotten ruled for his, his Rolex and couldn't go home without it. So Ricky's or uh, 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 Robbie, uh, his uncle was the was a jeweler. He would get these Rolexes and doll them up like Rick's was and engrave them like Rick's Rick's was, send it out. Uh, Did it on spec the first two times and, you know, Rick paid. The third time, Rick did not pay. And, uh, you know, a a pretty crappy thing. These guys, like, save your ass from going home without your Rolex and and, and you try to take them. Uh, But, yeah, and I... I, how was again pertaining in this uh, episode? What did they say? Well, in the credits, it says get well to Robbie Kanoff because he had recently suffered a heart attack. And oh, I yeah. think uh, Robbie's association and Galoob's association, who was the company he was working with at the time, uh, mm-hmm. no longer were providing action figures for WCW. But because Robbie was so well liked by the boys, uh, he got like a little mention in the credits as well. So yeah, I just wanted to yeah. bring his name up. Um, how did he get involved with ECW? Uh, I showed up one day and he was there, uh, <laughs> it was there with all the equipment and, uh, you know, we're told that the act that it's for action figure. I mean, they had, you know, pan flex machines and everything to take, you know, body scans and, uh, photographs take, you know, close you know, 3d shots from front side. And, and this was all uh, like portable then. So he brought it with him. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, uh, I had assumed, <laughs> Uh, naively, I guess, that Paul would be coming to us and negotiating 
okay, what it's going to take to get your figure out. And lickety split a few months later, there's action figures out of ECW. And I, by this time, I'd gotten to know Robbie pretty well. Robbie would, you know, hang out the bar with us, me, Franny, uh, uh, Bammer, Chris. Um, and he and I became quite close. In fact, when we had our son, our first son, he had sent us a stroller and, you know, like expensive stroller, expensive car seat, bassinet, that kind of thing. And I asked him, I said, like, who gave you permission to put these figures out? And he never negotiated with us. And he, he got, got this sick look on his face. He went, Paul doesn't have the rights. I said, I don't know about anybody else in the dress room, but he didn't have the rights to mine. And, you know, I wasn't going to screw this guy because those action figures really did help get the, the, the word and the name out of ECW. But it showed me, like, if Paul was, you know, going to do business deals like that, uh, you know, in, in a behind this behind our back type of way. Uh, don't know what San Francisco Toys paid to Paul for that, but you know the, the, those kind of things that were early on in ECW, but would portend what we would see later from Paul in, in, in ECW. And uh, I didn't want to screw Robbie, and I forget the name of the guy that was the president. He was the vice president of San Francisco Toys. Uh, I used to remember the, the guy's name as the president. But I figured they, they've done this to help us. I'm not going to go pull the rug. And I don't know, to be honest with you, everybody else in that dressing room, who did own the rights to their name and who didn't. But I, I knew that I had spent a lot of money doing mine. And, uh, you know, but I wasn't going to screw them for doing us a deuce. Yeah, I, mean, I can't find his name at the moment. I'll uh, forget about it. <laughs> Is what I'll actually, I was going to say that oh, I'll find it later, but now I'm just going to forget about it. Um, uh, just as an addendum, sadly, Robbie passed away September 16th, 2021. Uh, yes. A couple more bits of news. Ric Flair loses a Loser Leaves Town match to Kurt Hennig on Monday Night Raw, episode 3, January 25th. It was broadcast one day after Royal Rumble 1993, but continues to put over Hennig, Undertaker, and Bret Hart on house shows for the next few weeks before renegotiating with WCW to return in the spring. Paul Heyman, on January 15th, is officially fired. By WCW, we've talked. Uh, I'll probably skip over this, but uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm going to read it out because it's funny. What's uh, in a fax sent to Heyman claimed that WCW's investigation of dangerously's dangerously being poorly dangerously expense reports turned up falsified reports at the Ramada Hotel, Atlanta Airport, South for dates in April, May, June, and July of the past year. Watt's letter was also claimed that the Ramada Hotel confirmed dangerously wasn't registered as a guest on the dates claimed in his expenses report. And it appears that you induced, uh, this is a quote, you induced Ramada Hotel to provide false information that you did state the hotel to support fraudulent expenses reports and attempt to obtain improper payments of approximately $1,200. Watt's also claimed that it appears dangerously may have falsified other expenses as well. Now, keep in mind that Heyman, was making $200,000 per year with WCW and <laughs> was probably the only performer in WCW at that time that had a TBS contract, not a contract with WCW. So he was getting full employment benefits from the big company rather than an independent contractor status with WCW. Why is he risking it all for $1,200? Good question. I... On the surface of that, I would because you know his dad was a big time attorney, uh, and Paul would threaten lawsuits over anything. You know, it's uh, you know a lot of times it's the fear of having a lawsuit it, because if you file a lawsuit, it's going to cost you a lot of money regardless. And the the I'd be curious to hear did Paul threaten that at this time? Uh, sounds to me like Paul, you know, knew like, hey, you know. If, 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 if you have a receipt from the place, it's not really your fault. It's their fault. Um, you know, you'd have to go back and, and take it up with them. But I think it's it, it looks on the surface. It sounds exactly the kind of thing Paul would do if he wanted out of his contract to be able to go pursue other things or you know who knows whatever else was on the horizon. Uh, but that I can't see Paul being stupid enough to to you know throw away that kind of money for twelve hundred bucks. It just doesn't seem plausible unless there was a reason for it. 
yeah, there was a, I think there was some like version of this story where he was, and I don't know why, but he was like constantly like reprinting out receipts. So some sort of information at the top of the receipt would disappear or off the bottom or something like that. But I can't remember the details. <laughs> uh, I'll yeah. see if there's anything else we can talk about uh, just before we shut this show off. Max Payne would debut with WCW on TV that aired three days after The Clash. Yoko Zuna becomes the number one contender to Bret Hart's WWF title. Yoko would go on to defeat Bret at WrestleMania 9, then immediately lose it to Hulk Hogan in one of the all-time legendary backstage power plays. Marty Jannetty was fired from the WWF yet again. This time for allegedly being quote-unquote messed up for his Royal Rumble singles match against Shawn Michaels, although word on the street was that it was actually Shawn who was the problem in that particular match. And Janetti was already on real life probation in Florida at the time. And two more things. Steve Armstrong quit the WWF because he was sick of the travel and going nowhere in the Federation as the very, very much forgotten Lance Cassidy. And mm. finally, uh, to end on a downer, but I, I will elaborate on it at some point uh, in a future podcast, the wrestling world, a couple of weeks later, lost Kerry Von Erick on February 18th, 1993. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to end that on a downer, but it was just the last thing I'd written. Uh, but for now, thank you very much uh, for watching. We'll catch you again next Tuesday. Shane, thank you for going through and watching one of the weirder shows, probably the weirder show out of the three we've watched so far in this podcast <laughs> in Clash of the Champions 22. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions or comments or whatever, you can email them to Shane Douglas. A bit, uh, no, what the hell is it? Shane, Shane Douglas, Douglas questions. questions. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Go on, you do it. I've lost it already. You do, you do the email, man. At, at Shane Douglas Questions at gmail.com. Oh, great questions. I love getting these because it spurs some of those cobwebs out of my brain. But please keep the questions coming. Anything else you want to know, please send it in. We'll get, get it taken care of for you. And uh, you might as well do the wrap-up as well because I think my brain has m melted and leaked out of <laughs> my ears at this point. And yet another 12-hour day of working. But you do it. Hey, thanks for coming and sitting under the Franchise Learning Tree at Franchise University. Class <laughs> dismissed. <laughs>